Hi, my name is Mike Kelly. I'm VP for Advanced Package Technology Integration at Amcor, headquartered in Tempe, Tempe, Arizona. It's my pleasure to be back here this year for the 2022 Semi-Israel Tech Webinar. Um, some great discussions last year, hoping to have some great questions to follow up. And thanks again. So real quickly, I'm going to uh, spend a little bit of time on what we're seeing for product and silicon trends that are actually driving these products towards the heterogeneous direction. Um, I see package trends that support that and then take a look at what are available in the heterogeneous packaging space for solutions. So new paradigms for, for uh, performance, I would say the, you know, the, the big story has been for a while big data. There's an explosion in the number of connected devices that uh, are connected worldwide. And you know that is an interesting story by itself, but also with the advent of uh, sophisticated graphics and especially machine learning, the demands for uh, scientific computing and machine learning are really in a world of their own. They're helping drive this total performance demand that we see coming at us in the industry so dramatically. Gaming, of course, is a, a very large and growing industry and puts huge uh, compute demands on those processes as well. And then this translates through the data center back into end devices for auto, PCs, and mobile as well. So uh, one of the primary trends that is, uh, I would say, energizing the discussion on this move to heterogeneous packages, at least in compute and, and, and starting at the high end, but moving down, is the cost for wafers. So as you can see, there was a major inflection point at 14 and 16 nanometer, you know, a, a, a nearly 2X increase in wafer prices moving upward to seven, five, and, and a continuing 10 to three nanometer as well. At the same time, you know, design costs per, per uh, product, per chip, are, are very non-linearly increasing as well. So, so these are backdrops on the big picture from just the silicon side. If you take a look at what this means for our customers' products and how that translates into packaging, technology and those implications. There's, there's a few major themes that are coming up and I want to spend some time talking about these today. Higher memory bandwidth, for sure. Uh, that means uh, uh, many things. It, it could be things like more embedded SRAM, but it could also mean embedded D, uh, DRAM, sorry, not embedded DRAM, but package DRAM of some kind, high bandwidth memory or even DDR5 or, or the like in a package. So bringing that memory bus locally, a lot lower power, more power can be spent in compute. Certainly, as we just mentioned, higher wafer costs, and I would say finer market targeting. So this whole idea of more performance uh, again and again is requiring more targeted processing architectures. Something that is a, a theme that's gonna be, I think gonna be a strong theme over the last five years, just just at the at the early discussion points of it, but chiplets helps foster or enable that discussion. Because if you have a piece of silicon that you can reuse many times, then you have economy and design, and you also have time to market that can help you. More silicon content. So definitely seeing more silicon. That means translate into generally larger package sizes, either because the integration of the silicon, whether it's a module or down on the package substrate, is driving the size and IO count in some market sectors like networking also driving package size. And then the last two are in regard to power. Definitely bigger power, uh, higher power, more current to deal with is forcing uh, a lot of scrutiny on uh, the PDN, the power delivery network inside the package, especially for three nanometer, a lot of package technology to help support that. And then of course, waste heat, uh, you know, thermal power dissipation of that heat is ever present and it's, it's, a, it's an ever increasing trend. So as I think about this uh, by way of market segment, 
things on the left here are the items we just talked about. Everyone wants to improve upon those. We believe heterogeneous is a way to approach this for a certain certain product mix. And if you look at it by market segment, you know, in deep learning, uh, it is a quest for higher memory bandwidth. In networking, uh, higher I.O. count, higher total switch bandwidth, if you will. In compute and servers, at least in the data center, it's more cores, more monetization per core. And the trend we're seeing most recently is a push down into you know, higher volume client spaces where that performance, that fiercely competitive performance envelope at a reasonable cost is pushing companies into a chiplet-based heterogeneous strategy as well. One of the things that I think has been understated, and I, you know, I, I mentioned it earlier, but this idea of time to market and reuse and higher performance, it's, it's, it's a virtuous cycle that is creating a drive towards a chiplet architecture to a more application-specific or domain-specific compute architectures and reusing those chiplets, whether they're I/O or or compute, in in more products and perhaps more fine-grained market uh, directed product architectures. Really interesting space. The heterogeneous implementation path is really pretty simple. It is either a two-dimensional approach and or a three-dimensional approach up here. If you're doing two-dimensional approaches, die to die of some kind, then uh, oftentimes these products can be instantiated in a MCM or a, a substrate-based technology. These have been around for a good long while. The push today is to higher densities, higher silicon densities, um, stacked substrate, something I'll mention later. And you know, for thermal reasons, we're also developing a molded flip chip BGA MCM as well. More common today in the two-dimensional space, integration of die in the 2D is, is modules. And most of those uh, today are in silicon uh, interposers. That market for AI compute is very large. And so we have a long pro, uh, prod, uh, production experience in 2.5D TSV. But the, the path to the future looks like it's going to be high-density fan out. We call that substrate swift, but it is basically copper organic dielectric. And whether that's a, a, a standard interposer as shown here by the bright blue, or whether it's a bridge level solutions that put high density patches just between the die, uh, that, that is, uh, is a choice based on size and performance and some other factors in manufacturing as well. Most of my talk today, I'm going to talk about these two. This is, uh, I would say, the, the, the path that is showing up most frequently as a solution uh, in the next uh, three to five years. Die-to-die -die interfaces really drive the technology. Whether you're using a parallel interface or a serial interface can have heavy implications for the package technology. If it's parallel, and very physically wide bus, a lot of physical lines like a HBM data bus, um, then that drives packaging technology quite hard and you'll probably end up in a, a high density module of some kind. We'll talk more about that. If you have a serial interface, these serial interfaces tend to run really fast, but fewer physical lines and perhaps uh, stay in a substrate based technology. Certainly seeing that in some class of products uh, as well. So just to reiterate, if you're in a parallel interface, you're probably looking at a high density module of some kind. 2.5D has been around for a good long while, very mature. Substrate Swift or high density fan out is up and coming. We're seeing more customers move to that direction. And S-Connect is a variant of that where you put the bridge, whether it's a silicon based bridge or a high density fan out bridge, in just those small locations between the die and the rest of the package, uh, rest of the module, is fabricated in more standard, uh, I would say, standard density uh, fan out technologies. And then if you can stay in an MCM um, with fewer physical lines and still get that rounding done, great solution. 
2.5D, we have been in production since 2017. It's a very mature technology. One of the things I like to mention is because silicon is sitting on silicon, we've never seen a silicon or locate dielectric or bump related failure. You know, those CTEs are so similar. The stresses are very small. And, and you know, you can have, uh, you know, already a great deal of confidence that's going to be okay from a silicon standpoint. Um, the the uh, approaches today are, are largely targeted at going to larger and larger systems. This usually means more and more memory, higher total bandwidth in the product. We are uh, uh, taking our 2.5D technology and qualifying it in a stacked substrate, predominantly for cost for certain classes of products. A very interesting combination. Going to mention that in just a little bit. Uh, you know, uh, substrates larger, uh, interposers certainly larger as well. More HBM, more bandwidth. So, quick summary. Uh, this is a mature technology. We've been in high volume production since 2017. We've added a lot of capacity in our factories in Korea to handle this over the years. Uh, we have experience with qualifying HBM 2E. We are in the process of qualifying HBM 3. Stack substrates, I'm just going to mention for a minute, but this is something that is really targeting the total substrate cost situation. As ABF substrates uh, get larger, as you know, yields go down substantially, the cost goes up uh, very nonlinearly. So uh, if you can stack substrates, and in this case, our development was targeted around 2.5D module, but this could be a, a bare die silicon. This could be, you know, one die or two die. Uh, in this case, it was a 2.5D module with HBM and a processor. And that module sits on, an a, on, a, on a fairly classic ABF cord substrate, but smaller than it would have been if we had brought the terminal pitch of the BGAs out to one millimeter. In this case, 0 0.6, uh, 0 0.65 uh, millimeter, perhaps 0.5 is a, a kind of a working low end for that. The whole idea is to keep this really expensive substrate smaller and then do the final step out to one millimeter or something like that on a, on a pre-preg like uh, substrate with a, with a lower layer count, typically four layers or six layers. And this can be a quite dramatic uh, reduction in total substrate cost. We have passed our internal qualifications uh, and we just completed a full functional qual at our alpha customers well. A few concepts, if you have two substrate surfaces to use, there are some things you can do that you can't do with one substrate surface. So, you know, things like places to put voltage regulation, even potentially places to put, you know, silicon photonics transceivers, something like this, all possibilities. Um, and so that's an interesting place the, uh, for, from a substrate-based technology. I want to swift shift gears over to high-density fan out. We call it substrate swift. If I think of, uh, you know, sort of the roots and the history of this, we got started in 2.5D years ago. But the concept of an interposer and attaching dye to an interposer and then molding that interposer, molding that wafer, and then singulating and using that as a module that goes on to more or less a standard flip chip BGA line so that those big modules or more small, smaller big modules can be attached to the package substrate, just like a flip chip die, more or less. And, and so, you know, that I would say seeded the industry and got us up the learning curve on dealing with, you know, uh, another class of uh, high density, another class of, uh, you know, cleanliness requirements, build the infrastructure. And then uh, when high density fan out came around, you know, there was a lot of infrastructure already in place. And the idea is still essentially the same. Create an interposer that has high density routing here between all these die and, and then attach die, or perhaps in some cases, die first and then the interposer. For large systems, we still recommend dies last, um, meaning fabricate the interposer first and then uh, fabricate the interposer first and then attach the functional die 
mold that part, back grind it, and then make that interposer available to go on to package substrates. It, I would say recently, you know, this is just over the last couple of years, there's been a diversification, kind of a segmentation, if you will, between uh, what I would call smaller, lower cost and larger, you know, higher cost systems. Um, in the cost emphasis piece, it, it tends to be uh, small die and very small pitch. And in order to derive a performance benefit at an acceptable cost, cost emphasis is really, is really uh, a first order there. As you're going to larger and larger systems, the, the idea generally is I need to get more silicon into this part and more and more chiplets uh, to make it a viable uh, product. And so those are targeted at two, different uh, at two different market segments. In general, the technology is the same. In a cost emphasis approach, we are using a mix of dyes first and dyes last approaches whether you fabricate the interposer uh, on top of the die or whether you attach the die to the interposer that's already fabricated. Um, our substrate swift technology, here's a cartoon of it, but a better, a better rendition over here on the right. This is the uh, die with uh, uh, usually copper pillar, but a, uh, copper pillar bumps. Um, those pitches are, are, I would say, 55 microns or lower. We have some products trending towards 40 micron pitch. And I think, you know, the, the pitch roadmap for the future is, is uh, on the low end decreasing. Um, and, you know, those are derived by, that pitch is derived by in large part, two things. What, what the IO drive looks like, and then, you know, what can, the, what can this routing support? So as you, as you move to uh, finer and finer pitch, you may find a sweet spot where four layers or less will address your routing needs. For an uh, HBM data bus, you need four layers. For other die-to-die -die interfaces that uh, we're working on today, you need you can do it with fewer layers, and that's always good. Fewer layers, you know, it's a linear impact on cost. So less is less layers is less cost for sure. This is what it looks like in cross section. These are two micron lines and spaces here. Uh, pretty typical for this kind of uh, implementation. Um, real quickly, our uh, nominal target RDL thickness is three microns. Our target PI thickness is a total of six with three microns between copper. So four layer is qualified internally. We have a very nice, mature, uh, yielding, RDL process for four layers or less. We are working on six layers. We think four layers probably addresses about 85% of the products we're going to see in the next three years, but some products will need six layer. We're working on qualifying that uh, and moving through internal and product calls this year in 2022. We have built some products with six layer. There, you know, it's still early, but you know, we believe that this is this is an impact cost, but it's a, a, a reasonably low risk to extend our layer count. Um, larger sizes, we have worked with stitching uh, uh, quite extensively. It is possible to stitch two micron line in spaces. So, um, the qual vehicles we've been using uh, are a mix of ASICs plus high bandwidth memory. High bandwidth memory, as you know, is a molded part. Um, these are uh, technically quite challenging. We have uh, passed our internal uh, daisy chain qualifications on these parts. Um, you know, the, the RDL looks really good. Our yields are good, you know, uh, to a point now where, you know, yields are high enough that you can commercialize at the yield point we are. Of course, we're always working on yields. That's something you always have to do to get above that 99% mark, especially as sizes are growing. That takes a, a dedicated effort. Uh, bumps at uh, 1000X uh, temp condition G look great, as does uh, you know the CSAM images. So all in all, we have uh, a really rock solid 
high density fan out RDL offering. Um, I'm really proud of the team that has developed this in Korea. We have a, a, a first rate R&D team and uh, you know those kind of products are extremely challenging, kind of at the cutting edge of what is possible in the package world today. Electrically, the way we've got, uh, we, we see the positioning for high density fan out. It is a polyimide dielectric. It's a much better uh, dielectric for higher signal speeds than uh, oxynitride that you find in 2.5D. We're expecting that uh, 2.5D with that with that uh, dielectric is probably still good up into the six gigabit per second range. So, you know, a, a, a decent match all the way to uh, HBM3 data interfaces. But this range of interface speeds you know, up up through uh, 10, 20, and 30 gigabits per second is also interesting. So those interfaces, depending on what the customer is doing for, uh, you know, a, an architecture and what kind of bandwidth they need between the chips, we think this is the sweet spot for polyimid dielectrics, and that's what we're targeting with the SWIFT systems. So just to recap, um, we're working on... Uh, uh, several different classifications of products. We've passed the the die to die internal quals. We are working on passing uh, really extensive qual cycles on smaller systems with more die, and so things are tracking pretty well. We are uh, we are moving these through customer qualifications and uh, looking for engagements in that area. Silicon photonics is an area that's very new for Amcor. This is a, a technology that's been evolving for a good long while. Um, in, in 2021, we made a company-wide equip, uh, commitment to uh, commercializing the silicon photonic space and offering OSAT services for these kinds of products. There's been an extreme amount of interest, I would say, really in 2021 is where it really peaked. Um, and I think, you know, for as an OSAT who, who handles a mix and is interested in high, vo high volumes, uh, we're seeking processes that will give us synergies to help with CapEx investments. You know, those, uh, those kinds of transceiver constructions, V-groove, non-V-groove, active versus passive, you know, the, I, I guess that has not completely settled out yet. There is some mixture of approaches. But... On the whole, um, you know, we are looking uh, this year to define our uh, process flow early in this year, and then we'll have uh, our first equipments uh, on on site in Korea in Q3 with some of the earliest qualif qualifications coming about towards the tail end of this year and early next year. 3D stacking is a really interesting technology. We keep a close eye on it. Uh, we have demonstrated our mass reflow copper pillar lead free bump all the way down to 18 microns pitch. If you're approaching 10 micron pitch and below, you're definitely talking about copper copper hybrid. Um, we have done uh, some demonstrations of this technology uh, through FedEx flows, and uh, we're actively assessing the equipments required for this. Uh, certainly open to working with, uh, you know, uh, tier one customers on pathfinding this technology. The good news is there is a, a equipment set and a cleanliness standard offered by that equipment set as they're all evolving very quickly, such that, a, you know, a non-fab installation truly is uh, possible and commercially viable. So something we keep a close eye on. As you know, first commercializations of the of the uh, copper hybrid with uh, SRAM have already been announced. This is a technology that's coming. It offers some very key technical advantages as one one uh, uh, goes through the uh, architectural thinking uh, of products and what 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 is going to be needed to remain uh, on top of the performance cost curve. So just to wind up. Um, my conclusions, you know, silicon costs and complexity are, re, are, are forcing or causing a reevaluation of physical architectures. This is a natural evolution of this industry. So the demands on performance are, 
are, are so high and the performance expectations increasing so quickly that there are uh, paradigms that will need to be broken and new ones implemented over the next few years. It's an exciting time. Um, Chiplet-based designs are here. They're in MCMs. They're in high-density fan-out constructions. This transition will intensify as we move from 5 nanometer to 3 nanometer. I should also mention the power delivery network is something that is going to continue to be a big challenge. That will drive some package construction technologies as well. And uh, we are in the business of, of developing solutions now to address that for the future. And with that, I thank you and uh, I'll turn it over to the moderator.